Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos. Um bom dia a todos. Eu sou Denise Barbosa e estamos aqui mais uma vez ao vivo, diretamente do estúdio da McKinsey em São Paulo. O McKinsey Talks já se consolidou com um espaço para conversas ao vivo com os maiores experts do mundo sobre temas importantes para a agenda de negócios. E o tema de hoje é Transformando Indústrias de Commodity com Advanced Analytics. Hoje estamos recebendo o Carlos Sussunaga, que é Head de Transformação Digital Analytics da Alicorp. Bom dia, Carlos. Bom dia, Denise. E aqui ao meu lado tem o Pepe Caferata, que é sócio da McKinsey em São Paulo e Head da Quantum Black na América Latina. Bom dia, Pepe. Bom dia, Denise. Vale lembrar que vocês poderão mandar perguntas durante toda a sessão, Clicando no botão à esquerda da janela do vídeo, por favor, contribuam a participação de vocês, é fundamental. Vamos começar? Today's session will be in English. Let's get started. Thank you, Denise. Welcome, everybody. We are very happy to be here with you to share a very interesting story. First of all, why do we choose to talk about transforming commodity industries through analytics, right? First of all, we wanted to show you how we can use advanced analytics predictive models, prescriptive models, exploratory data, in order to change the way the industry works today. Second thing we wanted to do is to show you how through analytics and through digital, you can really change the commercial processes and the technical advisory processes of the firm, really driving a new way of adding value to your customers. Third thing is we can also show you how through data and analytics, we can create new businesses that are completely innovative and disruptive in the industry. And fourth, we want to show you a case that was fun. Friday morning, 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m., we wanted to be really talking about something different, salmon, shrimps, and it's a very uh, interesting and fun and different industry. So with that, Carlos, do you want to talk us a little bit about Group Polycorp first? Sure, Pepe, thank you. And it's... 8.30 in Sao Paulo, but 6.30 in Lima. So happy to be, to be here with you, <laughs> with everyone. Thank you. Um, so Alicorp is, is one of the leading consumer goods uh, companies in, in Latin America. We, have, we are located in, in Lima, Peru. We have sales a little bit over 3 billion US dollars. And we've been growing them at an almost 10% uh, Kagar for the last four to, to five years. We have almost 10,000 employees and more than 150 brands. But it's not, we are not only a consumer goods pro, uh, company. Only 50% of our revenues is, is made out of, of consumer goods. We have a B2B, uh, a B2B unit, a crushing, a soybean crushing unit. And finally, the one we are going to talk about the Aquafit, which accounts for more than 20% of our, our sales. If we move to, to the next page, Pepe, I, I can talk a little bit about uh, Aquafit in particular and, and Vitapro, which is the, the name of our, our BU. Uh, we have two, uh, two main products. We make pit for, for, uh, for shrimps and salmon. Uh, and, and those are very different stories, right? In, in shrimps, we are the number one player uh, in, in Ecuador, which is the largest, uh, the, the largest producer in LATAM. Uh, it's a fragmented, non-technical, non-technical um, industry, while in salmon, it's very technical, it's very concentrated with, with global players uh, in Chile. Uh, and then we are number four. So we were trying to, to build a use case or, or, to, or to build a transformation that will allow us to do two things, right? One, how to disrupt um, the salmon industry in order to, to gain additional market share. And second, uh, for the case of shrimp, how could we dis disrupt ourselves uh, before uh, someone else's did it. If we move to, to the next one, Pepe, I, I would like to, to show some of the, the main pain points we saw uh, when, we end, when we started working on, on this project. Right? The first one 
is that um, is that fit uh, represents more than 50% of the of the total cost of the farm, right? So it's very relevant uh, for them to be as productive as as they can be. Uh, the second is that even though they had a lot of data, it was recorded in a way that was not used for insights. Uh, and we wanted to, to build data pipelines to, to bring insights and, and new information to our clients. Uh, those insights should help uh, our commercial, as you were saying, and our commercial and technical advisory uh, to give our farmers, our clients, the best, um, the best relationship between feed and production. Right, and, and how to improve, implement their productivity. Uh, another pain point, th th those three were for the, the industry, our farmers, right? The, the other pain point that was uh, very, very relevant for us was how the, the tender biddings was, were made, right? Um, there's a cost plus pricing through open bids, which made increasingly difficult to, to improve our margins. And we, th we thought, we think that using analytics and giving additional um, services rather than just the, the actual product could lead us to, to better arrangements. And thus, uh, we expect a 30% potential EBITDA increase for, for Beta Pro as a whole. Uh, and with that, Pepe, I, I go back to you, so so you can share with the with the audience what did we do. Perfect. So seems easy, right? Feeding fish and feeding salmon and growing them. Well, this is done in the south of Chile in some very cold and sometimes extreme conditions, and the growth of salmon depends on many environmental factors. So the temperature is very important. The oxygen levels in the water are very important. The daylight, how, how many hours a day you have sunlight is incredibly important for the fish as well. Also the diseases, they have plagues, there are viruses, and those things also affect the rate of growth of the fish, right? And then we have a lot of production factors, so things that the farmers do control, such as whether they're putting uh, different types of feed and different mixes of proteins and fat into the diet, if they have artificial oxygen being pumped into the pools, if they have photoperiod, which is artificial light, and all these things together can have very significant impact over the productivity of the farm. And these factors interact one with the other in very special ways, right? So, the analytics solutions allows the farmers to A, do some growth predictions of how this, his uh, crop or his 14 months uh, of growing the salmon will work. Second, it allows us to give him recommendations of how much feed should they give any given day at any given time, given all the external conditions and the past conditions in terms of production they have chosen. And it allows us also to have weight protections, right? So what's the real weight that the fish are gonna achieve and then with them uh, be able to develop models that can estimate growth, models that can estimate and recommend daily feeding. We also will show you how this was pushed uh, for consumption of our advisors and the farmers through digital tools. And this required a big change management effort to change the way uh, everyone in Vita Pro and in the client were doing business. So on a more analytics perspective, on the left-hand side, you'll see many of the factors we've talked about, temperature, oxygen, light hours, all these variables came into the model. And our client had a, a model already, but it was a kind of an old model built on equations that were static. Um, and that's the dotted line in uh, dark blue you have there, right? And what we did, we, we created machine learning models, many of them, to be able to predict the growth of the fish over time in a much more accurate and a much more precise way, which are the lines you see below. You have the dotted line in, in white, which is the, the model, and the light blue, which is the real. And you can see that the, the model one 
is very, very close to the real, right? And this is due to the fact that A, we could mix many more variables in a dynamic way, B, we were using machine learning models, and then C, this adds value really to the, to the farmers because this allows them to plan much better their production cycles, and then on a monthly basis, you can update this and see how the fish are growing and adapt your production processes and your production decisions to be able to optimize the cost and the growth. The second thing we did is to develop a model uh, or a series of models to help you recommend how much to feed the fish. So you'll see in the chart um, red dots and green dots. The red dots were the reality of this pool, right? This is actually how much these uh, fish, the salmon, were fed every day um, through the cycle, and that's the red dots. And the green dots is what the model would have recommended to be the ideal feeding strategy for this fish, right? And you'll see two areas here. You see an area below the green line, and you see an area above the green line. When you see a lot of dots below the green line, it means that the farmers have been underfeeding the fish. And if you look at the uh, um, red dots on top of the green line, these are periods in which the farmers were overfeeding the fish, right? So what we do here, and this, uh, these are two real examples, we give the, our technical advisor and we give the farmer tools like this iPad you see here, where they can see their feeding in the, in the green dots, and then we start establishing on the right-hand side um, recommendations, which are the blue ones on the right, with a confidence interval. And what we started seeing is that just by doing this, the variability of the feeding and the, and the precision of the feeding changed dramatically uh, in the farm. And you see three points here. Point number one was a day in which they didn't give any feed. Maybe there was a storm. Point number two is below the line, uh, the, the, the blue line, is they're underfeeding the fish. They should be feeding them more because it's better to feed them because they grow more than the cost of the fish. And then there's line on three which, in which they're overfeeding. They're giving them more food than what is necessary for the fish to achieve optimal growth. So this is on the analytics side, but we also had to do a lot of work on the commercial and technical processes, practices, and behaviors of the people in VitaPro and in the client. And Carlos, if you can walk us through this, that'll be, that'll be great. Uh, sure, Pepe. Thank you. Um, as you were saying, the, the analytics uh, was quite difficult, right? Uh, we are talking about uh, living, a living species that its, that its growth uh, has to do with a lot of things, right? You were saying it, it, the temperature, the, the hours of light they get, uh, and plenty, right? The sea level and the sea temperature. The, but at the end, that is all run by amazing data scientists uh, that, that team up between Alicorp and, and McKinsey uh, that crack the code, right? But the code is not only analytics. It's, as, as you were saying, people, right? How do we make sure that our team and our clients are able to change something that they've been doing for the past 50 years, right? And, and how do we, we show them and teach them that through analytics, we can improve their productivity, which is at the end, uh, one of the, the key metrics uh, they are seeing. So, so we have to be very careful on that. Uh, there's zero value on, on for a company and a client on, on having an amazing model in my computer. We need to make that model available for the people taking the decision. So implementation and, and, and adoption were as important as, as the model. The first thing we did is co-create everything with them. Right? We, we went, uh, we, Part of our team moved to Chile, um, the south of Chile actually, to co-create and design a technical advisory play with both our internal clients, so the, the technical team, but also uh, our clients to see what questions they were having and how could we help them uh, with our analytics insights. 
then we started training the advisors. Right? It's not enough to have the model, the playbook. We want, we want to train them on how to deliver the, the playbook uh, the best as possible. And we also need them to, to get, we, we need to get their buy-in on that playbook and that what we are doing is, is the right thing to do. The third thing we did was to, to define KPIs and protocols to see how the model was performing. Right? Again, this is people uh, that have been working on a way for the past 50 years. We need to constantly show them that, number one, the model works, and number two, the model is learning the new, the, the new things that are appearing on the industry, uh, new, new types of feed, uh, new cepas, which is the, the kind of salmon that, that are growing and, and so on. Number four, as I was, as I was discussing earlier, um, in, in Chile specifically, specifically uh, the, the tender offers are, are through a, a cost plus mechanism. Right? So we needed to design a new pricing strategy and simulators to understand how much we could put at risk in, in order to, to win those tenders. And all of that, we enabled them by digital tools, right? So we gave the commercial and technical teams several tools that were able to, where they were able to tackle those questions and go to the clients. And, and, and as we were talking while, uh, some weeks ago, we are already implementing this in, in our Salmon clients. Uh, to date, 35 of our clients or, or 35 of, of the pools uh, of our clients are using these models. And we are already uh, winning some tenders using, this, using these tools. Okay, so then we asked, if we move to, to the next page, Pepe, how can we leverage everything we've done in Salmon to shrimp, that is our our largest uh, our largest industry, our largest business, right? Uh, and we realized that that some of the models were similar, uh, but first we needed the industry as a whole needed to 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 learn a lot about it, right? to to get a lot of of data, and then use that data to to create both the models and the analytical insights. So we are in, in a process of, of testing on piloting what we call the, the, the IoT and advanced analytics ecosystem. Right? What we want to do is use different IoT devices per each pan in order to get data. Okay? So some of those IoTs are automatic feeders, solar panels, sensors to understand level of ox uh, oxygen level, temperature uh, and use all that data to send it to our our cloud in order to build specific models for the farmer right uh, models similar to the ones we we have built in in salmon but also a lot of uh, analytical deep dives to confirm uh, or not some hypothesis the industry as a whole had and all that information, go, uh, we, we are building different, uh, uh, different digital applications that go back to our technical advisory, uh, technical advisory team that now should be digitally enabled to bring 24-7 advisory to our clients uh, in order to, to improve their productivity. Right? So I think this is a, a very interesting a example where we used the data we had in, in Salmon, uh, that where we are not leaders, as I said, and then use all those learnings to improve our competitive positioning in shrimp, where we are leaders. But uh, as some of you might, he might have heard, uh, a lot of, of large players are entering uh, our market. Right? So, so we need to keep pushing and keep developing new, uh, new things to, to bring value to our clients.
Uh, and with that, I think it's back to you, Denise, for the round of questions. Okay, thank you very much. That's an impressive journey. And can you, Carlos, please tell us how did your executive team at Grupo Alicorp got committed to a digital anal analytics transformation? Sure. Um, something we, we've learned prior uh, on leading our, our digital and analytics team, uh, I used to, to lead a strategy, the strategy team. And one of the things we, we learned with the CEO is that when all the executive committee team is uh, engaged and goes through a, a journey, they tend to buy, the, to buy the ideas we have, right? So we develop a journey. We, we went to, to both the West Coast and the East Coast to, to talk to digital companies, to talk to other consumer good companies, to understand what they were doing with, with digital and analytics. And, and with those learnings, and also talks with, with Pepe and, and the team at McKinsey, we started learning or, or crafting what our, our digital strategy could be. It was, at, it was two and a half years ago, more or less. And at that point, our strategy was very focused on, on commercial topics for consumer and very focused on making our current core, what we were doing well, doing, uh, use, let's say to use analytics to do it even better, right? Uh, it took us a while to understand that we could use uh, digital and analytics to actually transform uh, our company and even transform industries as, as the case we, we just discussed. And Carlos, at that point in time, when all executives got convinced and excited about digital and analytics, how do you kick off the execution of the transformation journey at Group Alicorp? What operating model did you choose? Um, so after we we developed the strategy, it made sense to start, right? But we were, as I was saying, we were looking on where to start. So, so we had to do a couple of things. The, the first, uh, on up on on your question on the operating model, we needed to know how we were going to organize. Um, and for for a lot of of the people hearing us, this might sound like a typical conversation in a corporation, right? The corporate center where, where I'm from wanted to, to have the digital and analytics team as centralized as possible, right? The, you, you've probably heard these innovation labs uh, that make all these cool things away from the core business. And then the businesses wanted to have it as centralized, as decentralized, sorry, as possible. Each of them, they wanted to have a digital and analytics team in their business unit. Um, so we settled, right? At the end, we said, let's build a, a hybrid model, a 50-50 model, where, where both the corporate and the business units push towards a common goal. And how we did it is uh, the, the team I lead have all the uh, technical teams, so we have the data scientists, the data engineers, everyone that is working with, with data and building the models we just discussed. We, had the, the, we have the experience design team, which is the people understanding the experience of the users in order to, to bring a better experience to life. Uh, and we have the, the developers and the, and the technical people building the platform. And on the other side, the, the businesses have the product managers that, that for us are, are critical. They're critical because they are the ones that try to assemble the, the exact point where user needs meet technical possibilities and a business for a little, right? That intersection for us is key and that's their role. Um, so they act as as CEOs or as heads of each initiative. initiative. Uh, and, and I think that with that model, uh, we were able to, to accelerate quite fast. 
and also uh, transform aliquor in a way such as uh, they were transforming themselves or we were transforming ourselves right it was not the corporate team building products and services that were not connected to our core but working with our core to transform us and carlos going back now to vita pro how did you ensure that this transformation journey had high chances of becoming one of the lighthouse success cases of analytics in alicor um, one of the, the key things uh, I think every company needs to, to start a transformation is sponsorship, right? Uh, so that, that was the first thing we were looking um, w when we were deciding what our first uh, initiatives would be. Um, and, and sponsorship moves organizations, right? As we were discussing earlier with, with Pepe, the the analytics and and the digital part of it and the technical part of it is it's hard but it's doable right a lot of companies are able to do it what it's difficult is to take them to market and find product market fit and make a business out of them so the first thing was to look for sponsorship uh, and then and there, Hugo, who, who leads, is the CEO of that business unit, was very keen. Was very keen to prove it in, in Salmon, because that's a company we bought uh, six or seven years ago. And we've all, always been number four. And the other three, as I was saying, are global players with global clients, which some of them are also in Chile. So we, we, we they were looking to to build something that was very disruptive right and, and when we presented them these these examples on what we can do with we could do with all the data they had they were very excited and that sponsorship started growing uh, and and became sponsored also but by the general manager of our of our chilean operation uh, and i think that was the start in, but but we also had misses right at the beginning it is tough to to get to to puerto Montt, right uh, you need to take several several flights it's cold uh, there's not a lot of of sunlight so we were working uh, with the with the quantum black and the mckinsey team out out of our lima office and at some point we 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 were not seeing the project moved as fast as, as we thought uh, it should. And we had to, to re-implement everything, the, the operating model, right? We, we moved the team to Chile, uh, and we were spending three weeks there, one week in Lima, in order to be closer to both our internal client and, and, our, and our clients themselves. And I think that was a, a tipping point and a key learning that if you want to transform something, you need to be there. Right. You need to be where, where the business is, is held. And Pepe, what were the more, the more important steps you took in the beginning of this process mm -hmm. to ensure success? Well, beyond the sponsorship that Carlos was talking about, it was very important to see if this was going to work. Right? Um, there was a, a lot of excitement about the analytical solution and the data and predicting the curves and the feeding. But we really needed to understand if Beta Pro's clients, the farmers, would value this, right? So we needed to spend some time with them, right? And before we did that, then we moved the entire team to Chile for a week, and we went through the whole farming process, right? From the genetics piece until the, the packaging piece, right? And we went through all the steps of the value chain. So the we, and by we, I mean our, our data scientists, our data engineers, our consultants, all the people from Alicorp that were involved in the process. We, we did one week of immersion there. And then we went to interview clients, right? And the, the answer from the clients was, this would be amazing, but show me you can do it. I mean, this is really difficult stuff. So, um, but we did see that this was beneficial, especially for the production managers, right? The, the people that are looking at the whole operation, they're looking at the cost. This could be beneficial also for the people in running 
multiple pools, and it would also be beneficial for people that are running the day-to-day -day feeding with the fish. So that was very, very important. Then this, the second thing is, okay, how that's gonna tie to impact? How much money can you make of this, right? So that was another very interesting discussion we had with Ali Corp and Vita Pro and um, discussing a lot how much money this would bring first to the farmer, right? So how much value this would add to the farmer, and then based on that, how much value this could add for, for Vita Pro. And then the, the, third st the, the third thing was analyzing the data, right? And analyzing if we had good data to build good models. And as Carlos said, it was a very painful process. Um, we had to predict daily feeding when we had data that was sometimes monthly or sometimes every three months. So there was a lot of analytics work to make sure that we can really crack the code um, and, and to really make sure that what we were delivering really had an impact with our clients and was something that our clients could use and could relate to. And I imagine that you had uh, multiple challenges in, this, in such a complex project. What were they and how did you resolve them? So I heard the, thir the first one was what Carlos was saying, right? Um, working together with the Chile team on the ground was very, very important. They had a lot of knowledge and we needed to incorporate all that knowledge into the models. So that was a big one. The second one was uh, we work hand in hand with Vita Pro and Alicorp's team to bring our best people from everywhere in the world to be able to crack this problem. This was a really difficult problem, right? Um, we didn't have a lot of data. The data was in 300 different Excel spreadsheets that was spread around all the time. Forget about a data lake. We didn't have data, right? So we had to pull like 300 different Excel sheets and build the pipelines to, to work through that. We did multiple experiments, multiple models. Um, so the, the technical piece was quite difficult until we cracked the code. And then the, f the third thing that was very challenging was convincing the technical advisors, right, that have been doing this for a long time in a way that is based on their experience and is based on nutrition and is based on the formulas to start telling them, well, this is a very amazing tool that can help you give much better advice and be much more uh, prescriptive with your clients and help, help them be much more productive, right? So as Carlos was saying, we had to do a lot of work in Chile, spend four or five months developing with them the playbooks, explaining them how this works, convincing them that, that, that this works, and then they had to go convince their clients. So we also uh, did some, a lot of co-creation with two or three key clients that helped us refine and improve this model. And now, as Carlos said, we are winning real business with these models. And Carlos, if, from a time... Denise, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes, please. Yeah, no. sure. yeah, if you allow me to, to contribute to Pepe's answer. I think we had a, an additional challenge. At the beginning, we, we thought the, this was a technical issue, right? So we really brought the best people, the best technical people, possible right? the ones that were going to that were able to crack the code I, I think we tried 15 models and, until we cracked it right? but we were too focused on on data uh, on the models on the pipeline uh, and we left the personal side of it a bit away right we were talking about that earlier uh, and we had to change we we, we did not only move to, to Chile, but we also changed the profiles of the people that were working on, on the team. So we could be closer to, to the Chilean team. And we also talked to, to Hugo and asked him to, to get a transformation leader. So he actually moved one of his best persons from, from Ecuador to Chile in order to help, uh, to help us. Right? He, he had a lot of credibility with the Chilean team uh, uh, and we, we partnered with him and, and his team in order to, to transform uh, how Chile made business, uh, business. And he moved there for, for nine months right? just to help this transformation kick off. Well, but and from a talent and capability building perspective, how did you ensure that you were building the right capabilities in your people, Carlos? I think that's even tougher to build than to build the models. Right? 
I, I, I'm sure a lot of the people hearing us uh, are, are trying to find these uh, great, great and talented people that are the, the data scientists and, and the data engineers and data architects. We're, we are all looking for them. Uh, so, so I believe there's a, a huge demand that surpluses the, the supply. So the first thing is, is we need to, to hire them, right? So, so we need to start thinking, how do we attract the right people, right? And, and I don't have a technical background. Uh, most of the people at Alicorp don't have it. So we need to hire very, very uh, technical and, and high skilled people on skills that we don't know, right? So, so even making the interviews and making sure that they are the right people, it's tough. Yeah. Then we need to to compensate them in a in a key in, in let's say in a proper way. As I was saying, the, the, the demand is higher than the supply. Thus if we if we want to, to get the best people, we need to to compensate them in in a very good way. But that's not the the only thing right we, we we need to to do capability building we need to train them because every day that passes new things are coming up and we always need to be in the forefront so so we partner for partner for example with with quantum black to build a, a, a training a six month training for all our data scientists and data engineers so they are constantly being trained uh, in, in the next generation of, of analytics. Uh, and lastly, I would say it's relevant to, to rethink uh, on, on their careers, right? Uh, organizations are built uh, to, uh, they build career paths in order for everyone to become the CEO. Of course, only one can become the CEO, but every HR process is built to get the new CEO. Right? And, and there are a lot of people that in, in this new economy uh, that don't want to become the CEO, right? They want to, to build models, they want to be well compensated, and they want to solve uh, complex uh, problems. So when we try to fix our uh, our personal leadership model and, and and our hr model to them it cracks right so we need to rethink not only on hiring not only on training but also on, on career paths for for them right? and i think that when we have all those three things uh, we we will be able because i'm sure we are halfway there uh, to, to keep bringing and engaging the best possible people for this and, and for all the things that we want to do in, in digital and analytics. I have now here a um, few questions from the audience. I'm gonna pass one to you, okay, Carlos, and one for you. Mm -hmm. Carlos, why do you think your clients will go for these innovative solutions? What's the benefit for them? Um, as thank you, Denise. As we were saying at the beginning, uh, we represent fifty to sixty percent of their of their production cost, right? Um, and whatever they can reduce on that cost is relevant. Uh, this is a productivity play, and as in most agro or or aqua business productivity is probably the, the, the most relevant indicator. How do we make more salmons grow faster with less food or less feed, right? Um, so we are actually giving them a lot of value and then we are getting a bit of, or taking a bite of that value. Uh, I, I think that the other relevant question which is related is how our internal client is buying it, right? Because as I was just saying, if this works, they will be selling less feet per client per pump 
that they were doing prior to this project, right? Uh, and that had a lot of discussions and, and, and a lot of, of talks. And, and what we, we realized is that it is more relevant to be the, the strategic partner of our clients, right? Uh, rather than maximizing one year's revenue. And for our external clients, uh, I think it's, it's, even as, it's even nice to, to tell them, you know, I'm going to sell you less feed if this works. And I'm fine with that because I'm here to help you make business and, and grow your business together. And Pepe, uh, a question for you. And how have your clients responded to these innovative offerings? How have you won new businesses? Yeah. So it was not automatic, as you can imagine. And as I said, we, we did a lot of co-creation with Vitapro's clients as well, right? So we picked two clients that were close to Vitapro, that were good friends with Vitapro, had a partnership, had a good partnership. And we went there and tested the concept, right? So we went with the models, tested it in ponds, in different pools. We talked to the advisors. We talked to the technical people in the client. And they started using the models and they're starting seeing a lot of value from here. Um, and we were surprised because the first thing they were really amazed about was just by seeing the data. I mean, just seeing the plots and seeing the very simple um, understanding of where they had overfed and overfed, just by seeing that it was like, wow, is this true? How, how, what happened? Why did this happen? Why did you overfeed? It, it was really, really eye-opening eye, eye to them, right? And then the second thing is, once we start building that trust, they started to give us pools, right? And when we just, they started to give us pools and they started to see this worked, we started to, to win more pools and then we started to win some tenders. Um, and they really liked the fact that we could go more aggressively in the tenders. Why? First, because we were more sure about that specific place, how productive that place was going to be based on the temperature and the oxygen and, and historical patterns. So our price biddings were much more precise. Uh, we didn't have to cover up and, and putting more uh, prices because we wanted to cover the risk or less prices that would leave us uh, with a lower profitability. And second of all, they started putting penalties on these contracts. So we were much more confident to beat uh, prices and to promise levels of growth because we knew from the data, from the past and the models, how these ponds would evolve. And that allowed us to win some very important business as well. So, so far it's very, very positive and it's one of the pillars of the transformation of Vita Pro in, in the South. Okay, uh, I have one more question here. I don't know to which whom of you, but uh, what's the best way to change mind of all the team about this kind of solution? Who wants to respond? So, so go ahead. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, I can start. Um, I think it's uh, walking the, the journey together, right? Uh, as, a, as a team, these solutions cannot be, be delivered by a team that it's not connected by uh, with the with the business that it's not connected uh, with uh, with the clients um, so walk together uh, and here i'm i'm using walk and not run right there's a lot of value there is a a lot of value to use digital and analytics to, to transform your company. Uh, but it's important to, to do it in a strategic way, right? This, this beta pro example is something that, that will generate quite a lot of value, but will take time, right? We are changing and transforming an industry. Uh, we, we were lucky enough to build this lighthouse case at the same time, we were building something that was very uh, automatic in the sense that it brought a lot of value early on in the process, right? So, so being able to, to build uh, initiatives that bring value in, in the short term is, is quite important to, to 
tell the company right that that this brings value and then get their their acceptance to do to do more tricky things like this okay yeah i would complement very quickly um on vita pro i think it was very important that this was the project mm -hmm. right and and ugo was um focused on it and the management team was focused on it and we were doing this project and we were changing everything from the data to the models to the behaviors of the people to the behaviors of the client it was a big project right so everybody went for it if the decision had been to do like several different small projects that didn't talk to each other we would have failed so i, I think another lesson for this to work is when you start these transformations you speak in four or five very big lighthouse programs that add a lot of value in the short term that are really sponsored by the business units and go for them right mm -hmm. and not fragmenting a thousand little projects or pilots or experiments that fail to scale and fail to build uh, momentum oh, thank you very much muito obrigada carlos e pepe muito obrigada pela conversa de hoje e aos participantes que enviaram suas perguntas muito obrigada pela participação aqui com a gente hoje Queria agradecer também todo mundo que passou esses últimos 45 minutos aqui com a gente. Olha, para conhecer a agenda completa do McKinsey Talks, acesse mckinseytalks.com. Lá vocês podem também assistir aos episódios anteriores. E na segunda-feira, esse episódio de hoje vai estar lá disponível. E vocês também têm acesso ao McKinsey Talks, é versão em áudio, no Spotify. Obrigada de novo a vocês, a vocês. Obrigado. Um abraço, bom fim de semana.